Okay, uh, uh, that's us on air just now. Uh, so this is a general club coming to you from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow in the uh, new boardroom, uh, and also from Plymouth University. And we're joined by Emma Cowley, uh, lecturer at Plymouth University. Uh, Emma, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, nice to see everybody here this evening. I'm hoping um, that you won't have too much of a lag between us uh, talking and listening to each other, but just to be on the safe side, it might be good to just leave it a little pause if, uh, if we're making a good point and then waiting to hear people's response to that. Um, I think what I'd like to do is open up this discussion with a few, it's unusual really to do this, but perhaps with a few ground rules, um, given the sensitivity of the, uh, the topic. It's not in the first instance, a discussion about faith, prayer, religion, or um, what seems to be what the paper is in fact first about. Um, and so for that reason, I don't feel it's particularly necessary for us to declare our own um, uh, faith or lack of faith, uh, and rather to take a look at the, uh, the paper from a methodological point of view. Um, so I presume everybody's quite happy with that. Um, that's not to suggest that we can't obviously have our own opinions, um, but I think it'd be important that, that we are respectful to those who are of faith and those who are not of faith during the discussion. So, so to begin with, um, I, I hope you've had a chance to take a look at the article. Um, the way that I think would be good to perhaps approach this, because I'm not quite sure what your backgrounds are, is perhaps first of all for me to understand a bit about you. So could I just have a very quick indicator around the room who's a clinician, who's an academic, who's a student? Who have we got listening in? Yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, Anne. Uh, so my name is uh, Alan Thompson. I'm a lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University of Podiatry um, and uh, a podiatrist. Uh, I'm Claire Hamilton. I'm a level three in podiatrist in the GCU. Nice to meet you. I'm Caroline Walker. I'm a level three student as well. Okay. I'm Helen Reed. I'm a level three podiatrist student too. Nice to meet you. Great. So a bunch of podiatry students. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the tea as well. How lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps while we're all settling in, um, it would be good to just, I suppose, uh, me to be uh, a little helpful in how I would approach this um, and I'm a big fan of uh, Trish Greenhouse you might have come across her and if you haven't I strongly recommend that you take a look at uh, her her book her perennial book it seems to come out in various new iterations every so often um, it's called how to read a paper which I find particularly useful is it all coming through okay Uh, Emma, just give us a minute. We had a technical issue here. The, the, no, the, no problem. I'm going to switch to some kind of video conferencing mode. It isn't the video conferencing, unfortunately, that we're using. Uh, one okay. minute. Uh, and I will endeavor to fix it. Back. <laughs> That's all right, modern technology. <laughs> uh, we fixed it. Sorry, Emma, we missed the last uh, part of your uh, presentation there. And what were we, we saying, Emma, just after the tea so, came in? Uh, so I was just um, letting you all know the kind of approach that I prefer to take when I read a paper, and it's born largely out of um, discovering Trisha Greenhalgh's How to Read a Paper book. Um, and if you haven't come across this book, it is, it's been brought out over several editions now. Much of it remains 
you know, the staples of, of good reading, good critical reading remain. Um, it's uh, How to Read a Paper, The Basics of Evidence-Based Medicine by Tricia Greenhalgh. Um, and I'm going to routinely kind of go down through her, almost her chapter headings actually during this to help give us some structure to how we uh, might want to read this paper and interpret it. If that's all okay with you guys. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. Brilliant. Okay. So the first question that Tricia asks is, uh, why do we read papers at all? And um, I suppose that's a pretty good place to start. So could I throw that out to you guys? Why do you think we should read papers and papers like this in particular? Keep on top of what's relevant kind of today, obviously from this standpoint, it looks like a, like a different section of society. Like more in consideration that it's um when we've been reading papers, it's been very kind of heavily like in kind a of medical base and physically, well of course more mentally, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that aspect. But why why do we read this generally? Up to date very quickly, so um, that actors will be out of date, so maybe like, teams will be most up to date. Yeah, so. Think about, about current, uh, would be the current suggestion. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Uh, uh, keeping current, uh, keeping current with uh, the advancing practice. Um, Absolutely. Informing our best practice, I think, probably is, is key to that, isn't it? And understanding uh, evidence and the quality of evidence is really paramount to that because it's important that we um, have confidence in the treatments that we use and therefore we, we need to understand how that confidence in that treatment has been established. So moving on to this paper then, um, we can see at first glance that it's been published in the British Medical Journal. Um, is that a reputable journal, one that you would consider to be of high quality? By, How would you know? By, by and large, we're in agreement uh, that it's a reputable uh, journal, but your next question was, how would we know that? How would we know? It's a peer-reviewed journal, yes. <laughs> Who do you think reads? Who do you think reads the BMJ? Practitioners. <laughs> it's aimed at medical professionals. Was answered there. Um, <laughs> we think the impact factor could be important. I would um, agree, definitely. An impact is often based on uh, the metrics of how often a, a particular article is recited elsewhere, its readership um, and the breadth of appeal, if you like, across various sectors. The BMJ is a, um, a widely read journal. It's also online, so it's easily accessible um, as well as an open access journal. In this instance, the BMJ online version is, is at least. Um, so arguably you'd, um, you'd perhaps hope that the peer review process plus the wide readership would would mean that anything published in it would be you know readily critiqued and therefore presumably quite robust by the time it, it got to publication so that's the first thing that i would notice when i come to this paper is it's an article looking at an experimental design study in the british medical journal this would be something that i think would give it strength almost by default but it, my first appeal to you would be um, to remain critical, no matter what it is you're reading, where it is you're reading it, remain critical. There's always room for error, there's always room for misinterpretation, and there's always always room for, um, for things to be, I guess, interpreted differently from how they're intended as well. So, the, having, having covered the, the basics, if you like, I would like to now turn to the author or authors, as we would perhaps normally do. Um, how many authors contributed to this article? A single author. So my, my next question to you, I'm sorry to keep turning it to you, but I think it's really important we get some interaction here. Um, is yeah. is the, um, the fact that there's just a single author a sign of um, strength or weakness um, at first glance, do you think? So if it's a weakness, what makes you think that that might be the case? 
there's room for bias in the sense that he knows what he wants as his end result, so he'll push and think and it'll back that. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, where you've got a team collaborating, um, a team perhaps from different institutions, um, and a team that are moderating each other's work and all putting their name to that that piece of work, that there's possibly um, less room for error in some respects because then, uh, or at least less room for bias perhaps would be a better way of putting that, um, because the, each of the uh, opinions and the expertise of each of the authors would be reflected in that. Who is uh, Leonard Leibovici? Do we know him? <laughs> well, we know he's a professor. We, got... we know he's in the Department of Medicine um, uh, at, uh, in Israel. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of the other details, but that's a university campus or a hospital campus. Uh, so I looked him up on ResearchGate which is Facebook for researchers, for all of you out there that haven't come across ResearchGate yet. <laughs> it's uh, Facebook for nerds. Um, it seems that he is a uh, professor of public health, epidemiology and infectious diseases in Tel Aviv. So he comes highly recommended from his, um, uh, his position. He's obviously a widely researched individual. You can look at him, look at his contributions, his publications, and he has uh, numerous numerous publications as one would expect from a professor so he's not um inexperienced one would argue that he could be considered an expert um in his field he's widely published and therefore his expert opinion whilst it is an opinion would be a highly informed one yeah, Well, we may have lost Anna temporarily there. So she's, um, we've lost Emma temporarily, uh, but uh, hopefully she'll uh, join us again in just a minute. Um, <coughs> we still seem to be broadcasting though. So um, where have we got to get the article? Okay, so we've been talking about the author. Um, and, uh, Emma had looked him up on the Facebook for researchers um, and uh, discovered a bit more information. That's one of the things you can do. Uh, uh, also, a uh, very brave of the author in this case, and his email address here, particularly in uh, a quite a, uh, quite an inflammatory uh, article to some minds. Um, uh, I dare say he received thousands and thousands of emails. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, the, the next part that we're going to look at is the abstract of, of the article. Um, and what, what, what kind of information do you think we're trying to um, ascertain from the abstract itself? It's just why he's doing it, what he wants to get from it, what his findings are, how he went about it, his methods. And will it transfer to our, you know, is it worth reading for us? So, you know, in the sense, if we were looking at a piece of research to find something out, you know, does it transfer to our area of practice? Yeah. Like, do you read a lot of journal articles? We do. <laughs> 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 yeah. Favourite pastime then. We're also doing in-rape on a Monday, and this is what we're doing the same. But 
Say Jonathan, oh, he's, he's been and gone. He's been and gone. Um, okay, well, uh, yes, yeah, so you're doing this as part of your studies just now. You're uh, appraising uh, articles, and um, what I was going to get to there was the fact that um, you have to read so many articles now, often you don't get past the abstract mm -hmm. uh, before you ascertain whether it's something that's actually of use to you or interest to you. Um, so it's a very important part of the article because if it doesn't tell you the information you need quickly, uh, then mm -hmm. you may, you may uh, miss out on an important uh, piece of research. Looking for the question. <coughs> You're looking for the research question. question. And what was the email that you said? I am, we're back. Yeah, we're, we lost you there. We tried to keep by looking at the abstract a little bit in your absence. But with a slight technical difficulty, we also had Jonathan Palmer join us for a very brief uh, second there. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, uh, we've, we've been talking about the author. Um, oh, great, great. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, what, what I was getting to before we were rudely interrupted by technology um, is to, to look for biases, basically, um, and especially where there's a single author uh, on a paper, I think it's particularly important that we uh, take a look at the possible agenda and, uh, and objectivity, if you like, of the author. Certainly, if you go down to the bottom, uh, there are no competing interests declared at all. Um, and it's not funded. It's not a funded study. So both important factors in terms of the fact that the um, the funding could possibly sway the outcome if uh, a negative re result was seen. Uh, sometimes funders don't like negative results and can sometimes put clauses in to avoid uh, publication of negative findings. Um, and the author, uh, Professor uh, Luke Fitch, has said uh, there were no competing interests interest declared. Uh, I, I would probably argue that it would have been nice to have known what his... Um, what his beliefs were perhaps about prayer that might have been useful um, but although not not perhaps important in in terms of the uh, reporting but potential, potential source of bias or do you think it... a potential source of bias i mean you know that would be perhaps uh, i wouldn't want to to slight his character um, but certainly i think in terms of it, how we interpret the world around us we do refer to our own social constructs and i think it's hard not to assume that that would be the case so coming back to the abstract then, we can take a look at the, the question being asked and then how we feel that the methodologies maybe address that question and whether the conclusion um, answers the question we look for in terms of the completion, the roundedness of the paper, if you like. So looking at the, the title, the effects of remote retroactive intercessory prayer on outcomes in patients with bloodstream infection, a randomised controlled trial. Let's break that down a little bit. There's quite a few bits and pieces in there. So they're looking at uh, some effects, which they've defined later on, um, of remote retro retroactive intercessory prayer. Can anybody tell me what that might be? <coughs> so um, we are... Sorry. the same thing for the person alone. Is that what you say? And after, after the event. Yeah, that's right. So it's after the event, uh, it's remote from the event. Um, uh, to control an outcome in the past. Yeah. Uh, and in intercessory? Is it group? Is that group prayer, is it? I think it um, means uh, interceding on behalf of somebody else. So making a request or a plea, if you like, right. on behalf of the patient. So this would be the person doing the praying, asking uh, God or whoever they were praying to, um, to have an effect, if you like, on the, the person they were praying for. Okay. So that's a bit of uh, breaking down of what it is that we're actually looking at, what the paper was looking at, what the study looked at. Um, and then they looked at a, um, a group of individuals, patients hospitalised with bloodstream infections. And I quite like actually the fact that they've used bloodstream infection as a, um, as a term rather than uh, sepsemia or sepsis or whatever, because they're being very specific in the title about what it is they're looking at. Um, and then finally, a randomised controlled trial um, where 
on the sort of hierarchy of evidence do RCTs generally uh, appear? We heard of the hierarchy of evidence. Maybe I'm making an assumption there. Yeah. That's good. At the top, the gold they're pretty high, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> the gold standard, if you will. Uh... <laughs> Exactly right. So we're probably meta-analysis being the only thing really above. Uh, that's several randomised control trials, perhaps looked at each other, uh, looked at together. So then we need to ask ourselves, okay, um, you know, that, that assumes some quality. The randomization, um, the con the fact that it's a controlled trial assumes that they have uh, limited confounding factors to try and get down and limit it to asking the exact question that they need to answer. Um, without things getting in the way and bringing in the likelihood of chance uh, being at play. So a double blind randomized control trial means that um, the double blind bit means that neither the intercessor, in this case, the, the person doing the praying, nor the person being prayed for, as Jonathan's just joined the call, um, know whether they are being prayed for or not. So the praying would not know who they were praying for and the person being prayed for were not known whether they were being prayed for or not. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Emma. Sorry, I'm in a... <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. I'm in a... We've got building works going on, so I'm afraid I'm in a hole at the moment to listen to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jonathan, um, if I could just, just stay, just so we're absolutely clear, it's being recorded just now, so it can be viewed by others, so just, uh, just so you know. No problem. <laughs> And, and we were just in the process of taking a very sort of systematic approach based on Trish Greenhouse's How to Read a Paper Book, sort of working our way through the chapter headings, if you like, to try and work out if we can make some sense of, of what is um, a very unusual paper. Um, and we've, we're just discussing the merits of double blind um, randomized control trials. This was a parallel group. So they did the, inter the, uh, uh, the control group and the intercessory group were acted upon at the same time, if you like. There wasn't a crossover or a... Um, a differential in time um, when that took place. So, so far it's looking pretty good. Uh, the, 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 sort of the highest quality of experimental trial is ongoing here. Um, the intervention is intercessory prayer and they're applying it to a population of adults who had a bloodstream infection. So the next question I would want to ask is how many people were in this trial? How many people were being um, either in the control group uh, not being prayed for or in the prayer group. So taking a look at the abstract, it's quite easy to see actually. How many have we got? Three thousand three hundred and ninety-three. It's an enormous study by podiatry standards. <laughs> this speaks to me. <laughs> we normally do in n equals thirty. Um, the this speaks to me of um, the background of, uh, of the author, who is an epidemiologist, and this would be by his standards probably quite a small sample. They tend to deal in um, thousands and indeed hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions when they're looking at epidemi epidemiological traits. So certainly from his point of view, maybe quite a small sample, but from our point of view, we would draw conclusions from much smaller samples than this normally. And the next question really is then, why is sample size um, something we should be concerned with. Yeah, these are all good points. I think um, whenever you do any um, study that you're hoping the findings will then apply, what we uh, frequently do in these kind of studies is to um, undertake what's called a power calculation. And that would look at um, uh, data that we already have known as a priori data. And we would look at um, 
clinically significant differences um, brought about in the findings of those papers. And we would apply that to the calculation along with standard deviations and other things. We set the alpha level, um, which is the probability of a type one error um, and getting false positives. We'd have all that in the, in the calculation and the nice number and say to find out an, um, if, if you are detecting an effect in your study that could be applied to a wider population, you need X number of people. Unfortunately, in my studies, it's come out at n equals about 30 every time. And I've been <laughs> punching the air thinking, thank goodness, because that's not so many to try and recruit. Um, when you're dealing with people in this study, of course, there's no need to recruit them. It's all retroactive. Um, it's simply a matter of getting the medical records out. So arguably, he could have gone for a lot bigger sample if, uh, if, people, um, if there had been more people in hospital during that period between 1990 and 1996. Uh, but this is probably an adequate number given uh, uh, given the normal um, kind of sample numbers that we would use in podiatry to at first glance to think about getting a, a clinically uh, significant result from. But the interesting thing is that there is no power calculation declared. And that to me was a big omission. Um, firstly, considering the nature of the, of the journal as we first uh, noticed. And secondly, because of the controversy potentially around such an, an article, around such a paper, um, it would be to me elementary that I would want to ensure that I was able to represent the population um, with my findings. And so I would do a, um, a power calculation. And it might be that you know, 3,393 is more than adequate, but we don't know that for sure. So moving on, any questions at this point? Well, just, um... Just as you said before, there wasn't really, it, it, had we produced the power calculation, there wasn't really any uh, limitation to how many patients recruited to this, just simply by extending the, assuming the data exists, of course, but the, the you know, how far back you can go. Although, mind you, uh, 1990 to 1996, I suppose it depends how long they keep the records for and how easy they are to troll for that kind of information. Yeah, well. yeah, absolutely. It just might not be the data available now. So given all of that, it's probably quite a good number. Um, that he was able to uh, to access. But the trouble with, with retrospective as opposed to prospective trials is, of course, you're limited. You can't necessarily control the data that you're collecting. Um, the data will be recorded uh, clinically by physicians or nurses or whoever was involved in their care, um, and it'll be pertaining specifically to their wellness and their care during their stay as an inpatient. The difference being that if you were conducting a prospective study, you would design the study and the, the data sheets um, to collect data so that you ask the, the questions pertaining to answering the question. And also you would limit the, um, uh, the participants in the study through your exclusion and your inclusion criteria. And that's somewhat difficult to do re retroactively because um, whilst it not, may not be recorded, you'll notice later on in the article, they, they look at the comparison of, of um, the people involved in the study and note their similarities. But of course, that won't necessarily mean they ask the right questions. It means that they have taken data from clinical notes that were there for a different purpose. So it must always remain critical, even though this is a double-blind, randomised controlled trial in the British Medical Journal, I think already we're beginning to see some areas for question. Even mentioning whether we believe in prayer or not, we've already started to look at the methodology and why this may in itself potentially um, be a point for critique. So the other thing that we always do in, in research is define our outcome measures, our primary and our secondary outcome measures. And these are normally the things that will answer the question. Um, so looking at the title, they're looking at the effects or he's looking at the effects of remote um, intercessory prayer. And the outcome measures are these effects. These are what he's looking for. So he was primarily looking for mortality in hospital. Uh, the length of stay in hospital and the duration of the inpatient's fever. They were his outcome measures and these were all um, recorded in the clinical notes and he was able to draw that data from the clinical notes. Looking then at the, at the results, we, we can take a look at the, uh, at the article more closely um, shortly, but I'm still actually powering through the abstract, which I think is, is in itself quite revealing. The, um, the, sort of the, the big message was that mortality was actually quite similar between both of the groups. And in fact, it wasn't statistically um, different. 
So uh, the um, p-value came out as 0 point, uh, 0 0.4, which was a, no significant difference between the two groups for mortality. So that's the first thing to note is that uh, one of the outcome measures said there was no difference. The second was the length of stay. And in this instance, the length of stay in hospital and the duration of the fever were significantly shorter in the intervention group. And these were quite, according to the significance, quite highly significant p equals 0.01 and p equals 0.04. So some people could get quite excited about that. You could look at uh, the p-value of, um, of a finding and you could argue that um, this is highly significant. So what are your thoughts so far about the findings? The fact that we have no difference between the mortality rates, but high, highly significant differences between the length of stay and the duration of fever. <coughs> Maybe I'll, I'll put it a slightly different way to you. Is mortality, is it, does it follow always that mortality would, would follow from infection of, um, uh, of the blood? No. Uh, no. Uh, Jonathan, sorry, I muted you there uh, before and I put the sound back on just now. Uh, so I'll put you back on just now. Okay. What else might factor into um, mortality? Uh, the general health of the, the patients before when they became ill about the patients. Yeah, anything else? Uh, age. Yeah. I think they control for that actually, or, or he controlled, I keep saying they, it's he um, controlled for that. When we when we take a look down further into the article, um, we can look at the baseline characteristics of this group and um, we can see that they're um, uh, recommended hangouts. No thanks. <laughs> I think they're asking me to give a review for hangouts. Some, some. Um, we could we could take a look at the um, the range of years, and the the median is is the same in each group. But um, what do you note about the range? The age ranges here. Yeah. So we've got age ranges between 18 years and 101 years, which arguably <coughs> we, do, we don't know the distribution of those ages, whether they were age matched across, um, across the, the group. So we could go back and maybe look at that and see if they did age match the groups. Because if you've got more 18 year olds in one group and more 90 year olds in one group, arguably there could be an effective age in there as well. So taking a look at the methodology, we can look down and see if they make any reference to how they randomized and how they age matched the groups. So what they actually did was they tossed a coin to designate um, the intervention group. That's what they've said. They haven't talked about necessarily whether they, um, uh, in that paragraph, whether they have age matched the group. We can go down and see that they said um, the list of first names of the patients of the intervention group was given. They didn't know the people, but they just knew the, the, the person that they were praying for. So again, no information about their age necessarily. And there was no sham intervention. So there was no intervention that um, could have possibly been um, age sensitive either. So from what I can read, it seems to me that they may or may not have age matched the groups, and that might be a flaw in the, in the methodology. Moving on then, if we um, take a look to, uh, in, in the abstract, going back to the abstract, you obviously don't get the benefit of the discussion in the abstract, but if we go back to the abstract, we jump to the conclusion. And what we can see here is that they have um, read the results um, exactly sort of uh, straight, if you like, and noted that um, remote retroactive intercessory prayer said for a group is associated with a shorter stay in hospital and a shorter duration of fever in patients with bloodstream infection for use 
in clinical practice. So that sounds, uh, if it was, if you substituted the word intercessory prayer for, um, I don't know, uh, some antibiotic that was particularly effective, you might not at first glance uh, be too worried about that conclusion. But this is where I do want to look at the intervention. And again, this isn't to judge it in any way. It's not to say that prayer does, does or does not work or have an effect at all. But I would just like to look at how it's applied and what it is. So what is our understanding of prayer as an intervention? Um, as, a, as a medical intervention. Um, to... Do we do we know how it works? No. Certainly, the paper won't give the answer to this. I don't think. Um, it I was trying to work out who said what type of prayer. Um, uh, you know. Uh, if that makes any difference, um, uh, or what type of prayer it was, how long it went on for, and, and you know, it's much like uh, I don't think again, it um, it's a bit vague, really. It is a little vague in terms of what we would normally know about an intervention. Um, by the time it had got to a randomized control trial stage, there would normally be if it was a drug, you'd have drug trials, you'd understand the basic science, the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Um, the expected anticipated physiological response in animals in general, then finally into human trials and then finally into clinical trials. With prayer, obviously, we don't have that, um, I don't want to call it an audit per se, but you get the, the idea, that trail of um, therapeutic mechanism. Um, if there was a placebo effect being considered here, it wouldn't actually be that relevant because nobody knows whether they're being prayed for or not. They don't, they may or may not even know if they're in the study because of course, some of the participants had died by the time the study took place. And those that were still alive, I'm not sure if they were advised that they were being entered into the study. And even if they did know it, it obviously was, you know, a good number of years ago, um, between four and I think about 10 years um, ago that they were actually in the hospital anyway. So for once yeah. we can possibly eliminate the effect of placebo, We yeah, can make a point, Alan. At least four years gap um, between the last people uh, that were involved, the last people who uh, had this bloodstream infection, and actually the, the study itself. Um, as you, yeah, as you say, like range of that's 10 years. So, um. so when we take a look at the inter intervention, I don't know if you're aware of um, the, the PICO method used um, frequently in. Um, um, systematic reviews, that kind of thing. And doing a review of the literature, taking a look at the population, um, the outcome measure, the inter uh, sorry, the um, uh, population intervention um, comparison and outcome. Um, in this case, we would look at the population of being the people who have been identified as having bloodstream infection, the intervention being intercessory prayer, comparison of two groups, um, with uh, one without and one with the intercessory prayer, and then the outcome being these uh, three outcome measures we defined before. Um, but when we look at the intervention, like I said, we would normally have a little bit more information about the mechanism of that intervention. And in this case, we don't have that um, because it has to be, it's not, it's not something that can be physically measured. And when I went to look at the commentary about this, this, this article is an unusual article insofar as um, it's, it's set off a lot of groups um, in, into commentary, particularly rationalist groups and faith groups, who obviously both either endorse the findings or um, wants to question the findings. The uh, faith groups tended to offer a mechanism. So they were offering um, perhaps a, um, a theological argument for how God is out of time. The fact that prayer is um, uh, doesn't rely on uh, being in, you know, doesn't rely on contact. You don't have to administer the, the drug to a patient in person. You could do it retrospectively and um, remotely, as in this case. Um, and so it is, it is by far and away a very um, unusual intervention that we don't necessarily understand the mechanism of um, if we 
if we take the other side of it, which of course is the more rationalist side that would argue that there is no such thing as prayer. And I've seen some, some fairly insensitive uh, commentary, which I obviously won't repeat here. Um, but if I could just put it to you that it could have theoretically been any intervention um, retroactively, that is what the rationalists would argue. They're using intercessory prayer here as the intervention, but they would argue that it, it is in fact, um, it could be substituted for anything. Um, and one of them cited a coin toss. You could have substituted it with somebody flipping a coin or something. And got hands and exactly. Hands. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, was it was it truly an effect of the intervention, or did it come down to chance? Were these findings um, down to chance? That's the question. Or was it an effect of prayer? And I'd like to know your thoughts. <clears throat> Uh, you don't sorry i was going to say you don't need to uh, belie your own faith here you can simply come at it from the discussion that we've had so far well i can say personally i can say personally that um uh at first glance i was surprised when you said in this article uh, originally my first listener was surprised uh, for a lot of the fact that we talked about right at the start of this uh, journal club uh this is a very well respected journal uh, it seemed to be of the gold standard type of uh, scientific study that we would look for. Um, and when I read to the bottom of the abstract, which is as far as I'll go often, uh, before deciding whether or not to uh, go any further, um, uh, lo and behold, I was presented with the idea that perhaps intercessory prayer should be considered for use in clinical practice. Um, that took me by surprise, uh, uh, would, would, would be my reaction. Um, <clears throat> Do I believe the outcome? Do I believe the outcome? Uh, not particularly, no. Uh, I, 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 me towards this. Um, I think, having gone through the article, uh, there are a number of aspects of, uh, that, 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 again, we've been talking about tonight. Um, also, the, 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 the three primary outcomes uh, here, the, the, the mortality was the obvious, the obvious one, uh, that they would have mm -hmm. to report uh, in a study like this. Um, but you just left wondering if uh, the length of stay and the duration of fever were the only outcomes that they actually looked at. They may have looked at many other outcomes, and then those two happen to, by chance, uh, show something interesting. Um, and what the others simply disregarded because they didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, but as I said, uh, at first, I was. was uh, any other thoughts? I'm wondering. Some of the patients must have been already dead. So how can you take any information from someone who has already died? Because I think we're going to say it. Yeah. In the length of stay in hospital because of time. Maybe from the time. But it's a different understanding mm -hmm. of time. So yeah. we see time as traveling in a, in a forward motion. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what they're saying is God. Or does not exist within that time frame, so you can pray back yeah. because God's not on that same time frame as us. So you could still be praying back if some of the subjects died in 1992, for instance. But the fact that the prayers offered up late, they're saying on God's time frame doesn't stop God intervening. On what is in the past in our time frame. Yeah. So that's an immeasurable thing, though, isn't it? So. Yes. That's certainly the faith group's um, yeah. argument um, that that is their premise of how, how prayer works, how God works. Um, and uh, obviously, that is reliant on that being true. Um, and I'm not here to suggest that it is or it is not true, but that is the, the premise that that interpretation um, is based on. When we take a look at the um, how much do I believe it question, um, I, I go back to the statistics um, often, um, and this has been quite a recent part of my journey. I wouldn't have normally gone to the statistics as a first port of call. But what I notice is that they've used, um, sorry, they, I keep saying they, he has used um, non-parametric um, tests to evaluate and to analyse the data. I don't know what, what, how far you are along in your um, journey in statistics, so I'll just fill in the gaps here from, from my own learning and use of statistics. Um, 
one of the first things you do with a set of data is you test it for normality. And this would be that it represents a nice bell curve. Um, it's neither skewed nor curtosed. It's not extra peaked or extra flat, and it doesn't have a long tail to the left or to the right when you, when you put it into a graph. Instead, it has a nice bell shape, a nice normal shape. Um, and when you see the data distributed normally, it indicates there's a good, um, uh, the, the mean, the standard deviations will be um, uh, fairly typical. You can build some assumptions into, into a normal distribution of data. But then you can apply those assumptions, or rather the programs that you use um, to assess the normal data will use those assumptions to process the data and come out with a p-value and a level of um, difference and what have you, what, what you might see in the test. Where you don't see that normal um, uh, bell curve, you might uh, assume that the data is therefore um, not normal and elect to use non-parametric tests. Without getting into too much detail, non-parametric tests um, rank data. They don't use the discrete uh, data values. They rank the data instead. And essentially it makes these tests less powerful in producing um, a, a result that you could have uh, clinical confidence in, I would argue, <coughs> because you're not necessarily dealing with the differences between the values, but you're ordering them as one, two, three, four, and five, rather than the difference between one, the difference between two, and the difference between three, four, and five. So I'm getting a little bit into too much detail, even though I promise I wouldn't. But I'm interested that despite the enormous size of this sample, that he still ended up using non- um, uh, analysis tests, uh, statistical tests, and he hasn't justified why. He hasn't talked about the normal distribution of his data, and he hasn't um, talked about the, the reasons for using um, his uh, uh, measure of central tendency, for example, is the median all the way through. So he hasn't used the arithmetic mean, he's used the median, he's used a chi-squared, he's used um, non-parametric tests. So that to me makes me smell a rat, if I'm honest, because I just think Given the normal, it might, it might be a result of the retroactive, uh, sorry, the retrospective nature of the study. In prospective studies, normally your inclusion and exclusion criteria would be sufficient to exclude the factors that would skew the curve. That would be, that's the idea behind the exclusion and inclusion criteria, that you can narrow it down so that your data will come out with a nice bell shape. And in this case, because there wasn't that limiting design Ultimately, it might end up that the, the result um, is this is a non parameter as a non uh, normal distribution of data. My thoughts are that, but I would love to know what yours are if you have any on that. <laughs> I'm not expecting too many opinions, but. Alan, how about you? Anything? Well, I certainly enjoyed your perspective on it. The um, <clears throat> the only other thing that I, would, I was going to say is, um, apart from, I have to draw attention to the, the final paragraph in the discussion where they compare it to uh, <laughs> uh, the, the treatment for scurvy, um, uh, which I thought was a beautiful little addition at the end of the discussion paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> but aside from that, the, 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 the only other thing that... Um, that occurred to me was about the ethical approval. Um, there's no mention of ethical approval anywhere. Now, certainly this is no. retrospective, but, but if, you, uh, if you genuinely believed that this uh, intervention was going to make a big difference, then this presumably would present serious ethical arguments about whether uh, it was uh, fair to give it to one group and not to the other. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't get mentioned anywhere, presumably, because I suspect that the author, the author thought this was all about tongue-in-cheek anyway. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. uh, so, I, I think we must be getting draw, drawing to a close, uh, Emma, because we don't like it's to... It's a bit of a heavy note, isn't it, to end on? <laughs> yeah, to, to, uh, to go on too late. But, but, but it would be fair to go and see if there's any final comments around the table. Uh, any, any final comments? I, I generally, one final point, kind of following from Alan's, I know that they had like a notion of the group that did pay for and a group that they did pay for, but what if a family member and the non peer group decided to pray for them. <laughs> that just, I, don't know, that just, I just realised that myself. <laughs> does the, is it their flaw? Like, <laughs> or we're not counting the family members because they're not in that special group that are protected.
Yeah. Well, that's a fair point, Emma. There's uh, variables here that add Absolutely. This is like when we ask our um it's like when we ask our patients who are taking any medication and they forget to tell you that they're taking 13 types of homeopathy or um, <laughs> dietary supplements and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just think, okay. <laughs> Failed to mention that you have a prayer. Okay, well, that's that's great. Uh, well, I'm uh, delighted uh, to see really so many of you. And, um, uh, so I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, thank, thank you very much for leading us through this uh, this article. We really appreciate your time. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say before we end the broadcast? Just uh, great to see so many of you. I hope that this hasn't in any way been offensive to anybody. It's certainly not the answer. Um, <laughs> uh, and obviously to anybody who watches afterwards as well. Um, this is uh, purely about the methodology. But thank, thank you, you all so much. Hopefully I'll see you again at some point. Thank you.